Hey, Tom. Everyone doing good this morning? Yeah. Holding up? Yeah, I feel you. I feel you guys. How are you doing? Yeah, all right. You know, a little, little frazzled, a little <laughs> frazzled, but it's okay. Yeah. Now, when's Laura due with the baby? Laura's due in February. Oh, okay. So she's got a while. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's right. <laughs> so it's, it is creeping up. <laughs> oh yeah because we're already in october i'm like i don't even know what day what time what month i i'm, I'm it's in a blur <laughs> yeah i know i just know sometime next year we'll have a kid yeah that, that's, a little boy. Be good. that'll be interesting <laughs> we're just gonna wait another minute or so just to see who else jumps on the call hey Good to see you, Shannon. Sorry. It's okay, it's all good. Is everyone comfortable at home? No craziness happening? At the moment. <laughs> Our how how many of you guys have tablets for your kids like an ipad or a tablet for your kids yeah if if i was if i was home right now this would be total tablet time you know it's a funny thing they uh i love that they have the tablets because it's something i can take away from them and i know it sounds awful but it works and uh they definitely you know they definitely like uh have the fear if we take them away but days like today if i was home with my kids right now uh and uh i had to do a call like this they would totally have the tablets they would totally have them <laughs> so. and electronics are being taken away this afternoon until house is cleaned that is a that is mighty that is mighty well i'll tell you you know what happened to my uh my um my Anna on Friday, she had to go to the dentist. She needed a bunch of fillings, which by the way, when your kids need fillings, you immediately feel like the worst parent in the world because you must have done this. Um, and they might just have soft teeth. So that's a thing. And uh, so earlier in the week, we, we threatened to take away their electronics all week long. Um, and we do, we will do it. But I had said, um, because she was going to get the fillings and she, they ended up extracting two of her teeth and uh, that, w which was not fun. Um, and of course they had to like put her under an anesthesia and uh, that whole process was traumatizing enough. Uh, but my wife was like, are you sure you want to take away her electronics for Friday when this was happening? And I was like, oh no, no, I can't, I can't. Who am I really punishing there? You know, just myself. Well, my friends, it's good to see you guys. It's good to be with you. Uh, I am, I'm happy to see your faces. Um, if you wanna put your camera on, um, feel free. If you feel better not having the camera on, feel free. If you're tuning in uh, later on after the fact, uh, that's great too. We are recording this right now so that people who are living their crazy lives right now and still trying to figure out life in COVID country, uh, hopefully this meets their needs. Um, as you guys know, we try to run the program in three kind of parts. One is in person and we had our in-person meeting, um, you know, last week. Uh, this is the second one. This is, you know, you guys gathered here. And the third one, which I've heard some feedback on is the video. Um, I hope that uh, whether you're with me right now or watching the video after the fact, 
I hope you uh, think about coming in person or uh, coming on the video call, only because the more we interact with one another, I think the stronger this is going to be. Also, feel free uh, if you if you need to, you know, ask questions, get in, you know more comments or insight or anything. You you let me know. Um, the the heart of this program is we really want this to work for families. Uh, we really want this to work for you. You know, we want this to be a good program for you. Um, enough of me uh, talking. Well, I'm gonna still talk, but uh, let's let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Almighty God, I want to thank you for the great gift of, of the families of the St. Ambrose community, who uh, have given so much for their kids who are going through so much right now as we are still navigating this weird world that we're in. And we ask that you, uh, first of all, give the parents of our community grace and help uh, that they feel your consolation and your, and your help in all things. We ask that you bless our children that we are trying to educate. Uh, we're trying to educate them. We're sending them to school or we're doing it virtually at home or we're homeschooling or whatever it is. We just want them to be the best versions of themselves that they can be. And Lord, that you want that for them even more than we do. We pray that you are with us in all things. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. And so I just wanted to start off um, thinking, of, you know, we, we have this part of our faith. That every time we meet, we're talking about a different part of the faith. And the idea is what we talk about. We're going to talk about at kind of an adult level. And then we will um, kind of break it open uh, and see how we're trying to break it open for our children. Um, and uh, hopefully you guys get something out of it. You know, that's the, that's the hope. Uh, our jump off point for this whole uh, year is the creed. And there is a part in the mass when we get together, we say, I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this part of our faith, it's something that we recite every Sunday, every time we make it to mass, we recite this, part, this, uh, this statement of belief. And for all the things that it says, it'd be really good to try to understand what it means because so much of the content of our faith is packed in to uh, this creed. Um, when we say the word creed, it comes from a Latin word, credo, which means I believe. And as one person put it to me, you know, when uh, a long time ago, when the, in the early church, uh, sometimes when the early Christians were being uh, killed for their faith, um, they, uh, s some would write the word credo in their blood on the ground while they were being killed. Uh, because there's something about what we believe that we take to heart and it's supposed to kind of breathe life into everything. And we're gonna take, we're gonna break up the creed for today into two parts. One is the statement, I believe. Uh, and the second one is uh, uh, God, the Father, the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. Um, and, uh, and, and I like to start with that statement of I believe. You know, we are living in a very unique time in our uh, history. Um, we live in an age of disbelief. Uh, if we were to go back, not necessarily to our parents' generation, but certainly our grandparents' generation, faith was something that you could presuppose in society. Uh, you, you could presuppose that your neighbor went to church, maybe not your church, but a church, and uh, that you shared this common thing called belief. Uh, and there was a common belief in God. And, uh, and, and, and often in, you, you would find in this country, at least, it, it would be um, you know, the, the God of you know, Israel, or, you know, God of uh, Jesus. Um, but some, a lot of things have happened in our society since our grandparents were young. Uh, and I think a lot of us might have that memory of, the grand, of our grandparents trying to raise us in the faith and trying to help us understand these things that were kind of concrete and you know, firm in their lives. Um, that isn't the case of the world today. Um, as some uh, you know, people who study secularity and modern culture say, you know, once upon a time, there used to be social uh, ramifications if you didn't, if you opted out of faith. If you opted out of faith, you opted out of the community. But that's not the case anymore. Um, faith is, if anything, something that people have to opt into rather than opt out of. 
Uh, you cannot presuppose that the people around you, the people that you work with, the people in your own family have faith. And so it's good to begin with this statement of, I believe, I place my trust in, because that's what belief is. Belief is placing our trust in, in for our sake, you know, our purposes, in someone, you know, not a something, but a someone, not an idea, but a person. And that person is God. And we stand here, you know, as gathered together as a church, we are saying that there is a God and he exists. Uh, and it, this, this might seem like a minor point, but I'd like to think about it for a second because in our children's lives, and by the way, in our own lives too, it is this simple point that can often get lost and be the first thing to be challenged in our lives. Is there a God? I think many of us, if we haven't had the experience, but well, I'm sure many of us have, uh, hit a point, maybe it's in middle school, maybe it's in high school, maybe it's in college, and you say to yourself, is there a God? Does God exist? And then you have to ask yourselves hard questions about the nature of God and how you relate to that God and how do you be a rational adult or how do you be somebody who can you know, affirm the goodness of science or, or what have you? And I still affirm that there is a God. You know, I've learned a lot in my life from uh, the people in my life who are who don't believe in God, uh, and it helps me really appreciate the gift of faith that that, there, that I hold on to this thing uh, with my life, and I and I teach my children the same thing that there is a God and He exists. Uh, there is a different way of looking at the world when you believe that this is the only life that you live and after this, there's nothing. Uh, there is a certain hopelessness that sets in when you believe that this is the only life that you live and then after that, there's nothing. Um, we as Christians gather together in the very first statement of our creed and we say we believe. Now, why do we believe? Now, there's a lot of reasons we might feel that we believe, and they're all valid. They're all good reasons. One is maybe because we were told to believe. <clears throat> we were taught by our parents and our grandparents, and they told us that there was this thing called faith, and it was important, and God was important, and Jesus was important, uh, and we, we, we just trust them. And that is a perfectly good reason to believe. Uh, another reason we might believe is because we had special experiences of our own that we uh, had moments in our lives where we felt God broke through and that it became something personal for us. And that, of course, is a perfectly good reason to believe. Uh, for some of us, it might have been philosophical or intellectual. We kind of thought through the ideas, and we're going to look at some of those reasons as well. But we thought about it, and it just kind of made sense to us that we believe. And by the way, our children are going to be the same thing. They're going to believe in God either because we told them to, because God willing, they will have experiences of their own of God and of, of the eternal, uh, or they just have thought through and reasoned through it themselves, or they go through that process themselves. Now, we believe in God. We can, we can know God in one of three ways. One is through faith. The second is through reason. And the third way we can know God is through his creation. Now, faith is believing with God's help in the things that God has revealed. So that would be called revelation. That would be this, this idea that God reveals himself to us and he wants us to, be, to, to know him. And he kind of does his part to make himself kind of appear to us in our lives. Uh, revelation can come to us in a lot of different ways. The, one of the big ways that we come, that we know uh, God reveals himself to us is through, you know, we say through scripture. But that's one of the uh, ways that we can know God. Uh, we, can, we, can, uh, so we can trust him through the Bible, through scripture. Uh, and we also might trust the authority of the church. Um, I trust those people who would preach to me and I've come to trust uh, God through the ways that God has shown himself to me. Now, faith is a lot of things, but one of the things that we kind of get tripped up on is we look at faith sometimes as, as a choice, and there is a part of faith <clears throat> that is a choice, right? We want our children to kind of make the choice to believe, but faith is not merely a choice. Faith is also a, is a gift. It's a grace. It's something that's given by God. 
um, we, you know, we should pray for ourselves for the gift of faith in our lives. It's necessary for salvation. We can lose faith. We might have experienced times in our lives where we, we felt a loss of faith. And it is a theological virtue along with hope and charity. It says in scripture, faith, hope, and love abiding, the greatest of these is love. But faith is one of those virtues. We believe God in faith and all that he has revealed to us and that the church presents to us for belief. Also, faith is certain because God never fails. It says in the letter to the Hebrews, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the substance of things not yet seen. I want to look at some of those, because we I broke up a couple different ways. Going God by reason, by revelation, and by uh, his creation. Um, one of the great thinkers of our church, and I, I think these, this is important to try to, to understand God by reason, because sometimes if we get challenged in the faith, um, it's good to know that there are reasons for our faith. That if you are in dialogue with somebody who does not believe, it is helpful to be able to say to them, I, there's reasons that I believe in God. There are reasons behind my beliefs. They're not just magic spells or something like that. There are real reasons for my belief. <laughs> and one of the great helpers for me is somebody who was a great model of faith and reason was Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas, who's one of the doctors of the church. And he was using um, as his base uh, the, the Greek philosopher Aristotle. And Aristotle, you know, when he came around, he had his, his approach was really interesting because he lived in a culture where there, there were polytheists. They were believed in many gods. And he said that, you know, as he was reasoning through the existence of divinity, he said, you know, using my mind and using philosophy, <coughs> I have to understand that for there to be a god, there, it couldn't be many gods. There would have to be one god. And he then would think further on how we would know that one God. And it's interesting that Aristotle <laughs> came to that um, because he did not have the gift of revelation. He didn't have what the people of Israel had. He did not have God revealing himself to him. He's just using his brain. And uh, Aristotle and Aquinas after him talked about five ways of knowing God. Um, and they call it the five proofs for the existence of God. Uh, they're worth knowing about, but they're, they, they kind of work along these lines. <clears throat> first is that there's a first mover. What does that mean? It means that everything, you see, when they observed nature, they said everything in nature is moved. It's in, it's in a, a, a state of movement. It got to where it was because it was moved there. Right, even the rock that's on the ground once came from someplace else. Whether it rolled down a hill, or whether it, you know, uh, you know, kind of fell from something, everything that exists came into came came to be through movement. And he said, if everything got to be where it is through movement, there would everything is moved by something. And if you go back and said, well, that, that thing was moved by something, and then the thing before that was moved by something, and the thing before that was moved by something, there had to have been, at the beginning of everything, a first mover. And he said that that first mover was God. He said that, that our everyday experience shows that to be true. Another uh, uh, proof that he had was proof by causation. Uh, he said that everything is caused by something else, right? I mean, it's very similar to the unmoved mover. Um, but he said, if everything has a cause, there had to be, have been an initial cause that itself was not caused. And he said, well, that first cause would be God. He had another one that was on degrees of perfection and said that, you know, we understand things as, in terms of good, better, best, right? There's things that are more perfect or, or better than other things. And if we have this understanding that there are, you know, if we say that there's a, a good person, a better person, a best person, right, or there is a, a you know, a, a good way to live, a better way to live, a best way to live, if we have understandings of degrees of perfection or, or something is, you know, beautiful, but there's things that are more beautiful than that, and there is the most beautiful thing, 
But if you were to go in an infinite amount of times, eventually you're going to find that the highest degree of perfection is God. That everything finds its perfection in God. <clears throat> this one, um, and this one kind of goes along with our second thing with creation. Um, but he saw that everything that exists has a purpose and it kind of builds towards a purpose. And he said that if that's the case, eventually that it finds its form in God. That kind of dovetails a little bit with the next thing, because we just, we're now we're just using our brain, but now we're looking at the second thing, which is creation. Uh, and with creation, he know, you know, they noticed, and, and a lot of people still notice today, is that when you look at the world today, you notice that there is a great deal of order to the, to the natural world. Uh, it has a certain grandeur and magnificence. It has a sense of design. And if the world and the universe seems to have a set design, then there would have to have been a this great designer who designed this world and this universe. He said that if, if there's a design, there has to be a designer. And the argument is, if there is a designer, then that designer is God. All that this forces us to do is to look at the world around us to see its beauty, to see its order, to see its goodness, and to say, where does this all come from? You know, our children are naturally curious. You know, they, they ask questions of us and they, we don't, we, we get asked a lot of questions in our lives and we don't always feel like answering them all. But I think it's taking, trying to make use of the curiosity that children have and help them to ask deeper questions, bigger questions, because we wanna be able to say, what is the cause of all things? It is God. Who's the one who set this thing in motion? It's God. What is the most wonderful, most perfect thing that there is? It's God. Who designed this universe? It is God. Um, now, there are reasons to believe. We believe to understand. We understand to believe. Faith seeks understanding, and understanding seeks faith. Now, just I'm taking, you know, uh, kind of a turn a little bit. Another thing, um, you know, uh, I, I think when we're trying to share this faith with our children, the, the primary way the, the, our tradition shares God with us is not necessarily through philosophy or theology or, um, you know, some of these big ideas, but as, as helpful as they are. But what faith tends to do is it tells a story. Um, how do you, um, you know, and I, I try to think of it this way. How do you come to know God, right? Um, if you're, you know, your children ask you, you know, why do you, you know, or about God, you know, what do you tell them? Do you tell them, you know, philosophy? No, not, ne not, not necessarily, unless they're that kind of precocious kid. Chances are that's not the way that we do this. We tend to tell stories about God um, in, instead, you know, imagine this way, you know, when we're trying to introduce um, somebody in our, 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 somebody to our children, like we're, you know, I had this experience recently with my kids, you know, uh, we were going to visit a, a good friend of my, my wife's and I, and I had one of my daughters with me and she didn't understand who we were visiting. And, you know, I could have, when we were driving to this person's house, I, you know, could have told them a lot of things about them. They're a really nice person. They're a really kind person. They're a very loving person. And that's kind of intellectual. But uh, instead, what I chose to do is I told my daughter stories about my life with this person. So I said, well, this is a friend of mine that I used to work with at St. Ambrose. We were uh, volunteers in the youth ministry program. Uh, we were, you know, very good friends. We both talked about Jesus with teenagers and we just, I just, you know, would tell a story about, you know, who this person was in my life. And in the same way, and, and my daughter could understand that, and she, you know, and also that this person was a good friend of my wife's and everything else. Um, when, our, when God came, you know, when God is kind of shown to us, often, um, it's through the stories of the Bible. Um, and the stories of scripture come in a bunch of different ways. 
Many of the stories of the Bible are historical stories. They're, they dovetail with history. Some are parables or life lesson stories. Sometimes it's poetry. Um, one of the most important stories in the Bible, one that, uh, uh, you know, uh, in this lesson that's coming up that is going to work with, you know, is trying to help kids understand, is the first story of the Bible, which is the story of creation. And the story of creation is a good foundational story for kids to know. It's kind of telling the story of how the world is created. It uses a lot of poetic images. Uh, it's, I think, easy to understand, but what does the story tell? Now, without reading the whole thing, you know, verse by verse, you know, it says, it says, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And it's kind of, a, these are good evocative stories because it, it talks about darkness in this kind of primordial beginning where there was nothing. And then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and then created light and darkness. And that's what he does the first day, is that it was morning and there was evening the first day. Second day, God creates the waters, and it goes through the process of God creating the waters. And it said, here's the waters, and then separating into the dry land. And then it created, then there's, uh, then the next day, after the dry land, God creates the, the, puts in the earth the vegetation, the plants, this yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it, it, it just kind of creates these images in our head. Okay, God created, you know, light. He creates, separates the light and the darkness. He creates the waters. He separates the land from the waters. He, uh, you know, he, uh, you know, he creates the, the vegetation on the land. Uh, and in every day it ends, it says there was evening and there was morning the third day. Then it said that the fourth day that God creates the lights in the sky. And this would be the stars. Um, and it's, you know, these are things that, you know, kids see every day. These are part of, you know, of their, of their lives. It's part of their observation. But it helps us because it, 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 it kind of points to this God creating everything. Um, and then uh, it said, this is after the fourth day, then the fifth day, the lot, God uh, let the waters, he said, let the waters bring forth living creatures and let the birds uh, uh, fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. And he said, let the earth create all kinds of animals. And he creates that. And on the last day of creation, it says this. And God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over the, every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and et cetera, et cetera. He says, I've given this creation to you. Now in this story, which is a good foundational story, a good story for every kid to know, it tells you a lot of things about God and it says a lot of things about us. One, it's, it kind of tells us that God is holy, right? It's good to know that God is holy. What is a simple way of saying holy? Well, there's nothing evil in God. When he looks at something, he says it is good, and he has the right to say that it is good because he himself is good. He is almighty. He can do anything. He says it, it happens. It's a good image of God to have for our kids' heads and for our own heads. He is all-knowing. He knows everything that's going on in his creation. He is eternal and unchanging. He is that first cause. He is that unmoved mover. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. And he is the creator of, of heaven and earth. Um, another thing it says about us, which is kind of interesting, is that it shows that there's a certain dignity for human beings. It says that after everything that God created, it said that God says it is good. 
he says he creates the light light and you know from the light from the darkness it's good he creates the land it's good he creates the animals it's good it's good it's good it's good but when he gets to humankind it's an interesting thing he says it is very good and it's a way of saying that because i am made in god's image and likeness i am created as very good i have a certain dignity that is afforded to me by god um you see that this reveals to us and reveals to our kids uh, just a certain image of God and how he works in the universe. Um, now, in terms of the last thing I want to end you with this before I hand it on to Jen, um, when we talk about God revealing himself to us, ultimately he reveals himself to us in his son, Jesus. And we kind of have this big image of God who created everything, creates the universe, creates everything that we see. It creates everything we don't see, creates stars that are so far away that their lights come to us millions of years later. But when God reveals himself to us, he also reveals himself fully in, in his son, Jesus Christ. And he says that I am, I love you so much that I have become one of you. And I've lived among you. And when he reveals himself in Jesus, Jesus revealed to us, first he revealed to us God as our father. He revealed himself as the son and reveals the gift of the Holy Spirit that is a way that we can participate in God. Ultimately, when we are sharing the story of the big God who created everything, it is also the big God who created everything and came to us in his son, Jesus, and gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of stuff to think about. I want to hand it out to my good friend, Jen. She's going to take us to the next level. All right. Thanks, Tom. I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah? Okay, great. Um, so in the next five minutes, I'm going to attempt to take everything that Tom just said and see how it can apply to our lives and how we can bring it down to our children's level and help them out understanding the I believe and God, the Father Almighty. Um, I'm a mom of four kids. So I just wanted to start out by saying one great activity that we do in our family is the alphabet game. So we took a, tr a road trip a couple, like last weekend. And usually when we do this alphabet game, it's you think of either, we either do animals, we do, you know, we can do names, just random stuff. And each child or each person in the card says the, letter A, aardvark, right? And then we go around and we have to repeat it from the beginning. Well, this time, um, because of what we're working on with our faith formation, I said we should do God's creation. So it was a lot of fun. We had a great time. The kids loved it. And it was fun to hear them come up with certain things and then the rest of them say, God didn't create that, you know? <laughs> so it was a good activity. So just something to keep in your back pocket if you're trying to, you know, teach the kids about all that God created and how amazing and, and, and infinite he is. Um, the alphabet game was a lot of fun. But moving on, what I really want to talk about is um, everything happening for a reason. So you know, you, you have probably all said that once or twice in your lifetime. Um, and we also hear a lot of people who don't have strong faith say things like that. So usually it's when something good happens, they'll say, oh, you know, that happened for a reason because I'm a good person or, you know, something like that. But occasionally if something bad happens, uh, people try to find the silver lining and they try to make the most of it and say, everything happens for a reason. Well, what I want to challenge you to do today is to help your children understand that phrase, but also dig deeper and figure out, you know, what does that really mean? What is the reason? And who's in charge of that? You know, because um, I, you know, we want our kids to not just live their lives every day thinking that the universe is in charge and the universe is just controlling their actions and controlling their lives. We want to really bring it down, you know, into their hearts that God is in control and the Holy Spirit is with them. And one of the things I love about the Catholic faith is that we believe in guardian angels. So, you know, just help your children to understand that. And one great way, like Tom mentioned, is by telling stories or bringing their attention to certain things that are happening 
on a daily basis. Perfect example, and I'm sure this has happened to all of you, um, you want to leave, right? You're trying to get the kids out of the house or you're trying to leave someone else's house or something or you're trying to leave work, right? And you're just, I got to go, I got to go. And something's holding you up. You're just, somebody wants to tell you something or the kid is in the bathroom, right? And, or this one can't get his shoes on fast enough, right? And you finally get in the car and you're like, okay, we're going to be late. We're going to be late. Let's go. And then all of a sudden you're sitting in traffic because there was an accident up ahead. And what do you do? Do you get angry? Do you get mean and oh, this, blah, blah. or do you realize that had you left on time, you could have been part of that accident? Those are the moments I'm talking about. Like really bring your kids attention to that. And instead of being angry, think, wow, kids, had we left on time when mommy wanted to leave or daddy wanted to leave, we could have been involved in this and god is protecting us god is with us that's our guardian angel that's the holy spirit and what do you do when you pass that accident you say a prayer right i say a prayer for the people involved i say a prayer for the first responders and then i thank god for protecting my family okay so that's just simple you know think about that as you're going through your daily life another example is um so we like, I like to call these things God moments. You know, that was, wow, God, that was God in control of that moment in, in our lives. But the other one I think about is um, my brother. So 9-11, right? Um, that's huge impacted our lives. And Kristen brought this up last week. So it actually made me think about it. Um, she'll probably share her story as well. But I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I grew up in the city. Um, so I, my family is, you know, was still living down there during 9-11. And my brother, my older brother, had an interview with the Port Authority, which was located in the towers on the morning of 9-11. I promise you I'm not making up this story. But for some reason, the night before his interview, he got a phone call. They were having scheduling issues and they needed to reschedule his interview. Lo and behold, 9-11 was the next morning, right? And he didn't have to go to his interview and God saved his life. So for people of you know, for people uh, that don't have a lot of faith, including my brother, unfortunately, he was like, oh, wow, you know, everything happens for a reason. And somebody was looking out for me. Like he does that kind of, you know, talk, right? And in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, God just saved your life. And now what are you going to do about it? Right? That was your God moment. He saved you. He's keeping you here for a reason. How are you going to thank him and, and, you know, try to live a life that's worthy of his, of his love you know so that's really all i have to say today i just I, you know i'm a mom like i said i'm a mom of four and i'm constantly looking for ways to make our faith a reality to my children and help them to really wrap their minds around this this cosmic idea of there being you know such an almighty god and how he relates to our everyday life and what he does for us so i hope that helped out a little bit today and i'm going to pass myself on to kristen hi guys um thank you jen and thank you tom so kind of piggybacking off of what jen was saying um when jen tom and i were meeting to talk about this month um, we were talking about like what Tom had to talk about, like the big theology of everything. And then when Jen and I were talking, we thought kind of the same thing we've been saying is we need to bring it down, not only to our parent level, but then as a parent down to our kids level. And so when Jen brought up the idea of everything happens for a reason, it got me thinking, just like she was saying, about all of the God moments in my life. Um, and we thought that if we shared some of our God moments, um, it would make you guys as parents or grandparents think, what are those God moments in your life? And like Jen was saying, it's very important for us to share those with our kids to make it known that God is not just this big, super powerful being that is not in touch with us, that he has control and um, all of that over the smallest details in our day and in our life. So um, it got us thinking about our God moments and Jen has shared a few of hers. Um, but looking back, one of the biggest God moments didn't even happen to me, it happened to my brother. 
um, when he was a senior in high school, um, early in the year, he went to see his guidance counselor about colleges. He had no idea where he wanted to go. Um, he just knew he wanted a good science program and a school that had at least an intramural or like a club hockey team because he played hockey. Um, and <laughs> I saw you, Jen, or I saw you, Shannon. Um, so when he went to his guidance counselor, strangely enough, the St. Bonaventure pamphlet was on top and they have a great science program. And he was looking through it and the pictures, like this campus is gorgeous. And so we went out there and the minute that we pulled up and we got out of the car, my brother said he just had this sense, you know that sense of peace you get? It's just like, this is where I'm meant to be. And he had that moment. And I was only a sophomore in, in high school. So I'm like, whatever, this will be a fun weekend. It's beautiful, it's fall. Um, but because he went, and I visited him, um, it's where I chose to go too. And in doing that, my brother um, met his wife at St. Bonaventure. I met my husband there. And both of us, we grew up Episcopalian um, because we wanted to marry these new people in our lives. We went through the RCIA program and became Catholic. So that one decision or that one God moment of that brochure being on top literally set off my brother in my life. Um, and then, like Jen was saying, 9-11 was a huge thing for um, my now husband and I. I was a, a senior in college and my husband was, he had just finished up flight school. But our God moment actually happened with him in flight school. He was training to be a Black Hawk helicopter pilot because even though his dream was to be a Chinook helicopter pilot, those big buses that fly in the sky with the two rotors. Um, at the time, it was very hard to become a Chinook pilot. It was maybe like two people out of a whole flight school became a Chinook pilot. So he was not chosen, but he was, you know, fine becoming a Black Hawk pilot. And all of a sudden, towards the end of two th or towards the end of his flight school, which was like April, May. Um, some military commander came down and he said, we are going to expand our Chinook program and we now want 14 people um, from every flight school to train on Chinooks. We just think that we need more transportation because that's what a Chinook helicopter does. It transports troops, it transports vehicles, it transports everything. So my husband was then chosen. So he had to quickly switch mindsets and learn how to um, fly this new helicopter. So flight school ended um, the last few days of August. I was in my senior year at college. He came up to visit me. Um, and sure enough, while he was up visiting me, 9-11 hit. And I'm not gonna go into the whole story I did last week, but because all of a sudden some military mind had this idea that they needed to expand their um, transportation, now they were ready, as ready as you ever can be, for um, what happened when we had to go into Afghanistan and Iraq. So I, we, we look at it as a God moment. God knew that he needed capable people at this time, and he put that on some, somebody's heart, somebody's mind, I don't know, a whole army, um, that things needed to change. And they ended up being more prepared than they'd ever had been for a situation like that. So things like that, we just have to realize, we as people of faith realize that they're God moments, not just everything happens for a reason. And my last one is this past weekend, we went up to Lake Placid and we have kind of a brand new van. Of course, I have four kids also, I need a van. And we decided to drive up Whiteface Mountain. I don't know if you all know, there's a side road that literally goes up the whole mountain. You're on the edge of a cliff. No big deal, right? What's worse that could happen? Um, so we made it up there. Beautiful. It was cold. Um, the clouds were coming in, but we, of course, were joking, like, wouldn't it suck if, like, our brakes decided to fail on the way down, because you're going from 4,000 feet down to zero. 
And sure enough, halfway down, my husband's like, breaking is not really all that great. And I kind of was looking at him. And then all of a sudden, all of those warning lights came on one after another. Brake system failure, power brake or power steering failure. Um, you name it, it was failing on my car. And we still had half the mountain to go. So we pulled over. My husband's like, look in the manual, see if it says to do anything. And I'm looking and literally, you know, these manuals, they're completely useless. So I'm like, I have nothing. Like, let's shut the car off. Maybe it's overheating. And he, so we shut it off, turned it back on, same thing. And so we shut it off one more time. He looks at me, he goes, can you just look one more time in the manual? Something has to be happening. But while we had the shut off, I turned to the kids. I was like, remember, we have guardian angels. I said, worst case, dad has crash land a helicopter. He can handle a car. Okay. So, um, we're all saying our prayers. Of course, I've got two kids crying because they're over dramatic. Um, and he goes, just look one more time. So I opened the manual and God's honest truth. I open up to this page I had never seen before that said, if this happens, do this. I, I'm going to look to see if that's still in the manual. Cause I swear to goodness, it was a God thing. So I said, you're not going to believe this, but it says, if you get this power system failure, whatever, it says to pump the brakes twice. And if the, if the warning goes away, then it was probably just like a little fluke thing. Like the car was overheating and some wire touched something it wasn't supposed to touch. So my husband pumps the brake twice. Everything goes away. What? <laughs> so it was one of those things that we had all said our prayers. We did our guardian angel prayer and we pumped the brakes twice. And sure enough, our car is good to go. We make it down the mountain. We make it home safely. Um, so I looked at the kids and I was, I said the same thing that Father Kelly says all the time. I'm like, isn't God good? Like God literally made me open up to this page that may or may not actually exist, pumped the brakes twice, and our car is going to get us home safely. So we just want to make sure as parents that we're really making our kids aware of these God moments because there's no better way to show the awesomeness of God than to bring him down literally to our level. Um, I mean, it's great to talk about all the big things God does, creation, all of that, but for us to know him as intimately as we should, we need to show that these are God moments. Um, and like Jen said, that he's got us, you know, like it, he, he is going to help us through every part of our lives, big or small. Um, and it's important for us to show that to our kids. And that's all I've got. I just, what a beautiful story and what a re good reminder though for all of us to thank God you're, thank God you're good. <laughs> thank God you're safe. But honestly, like what a reminder for all of us. I mean, we all have kids. We're all in the thick of it. We're all in this chaos where we kind of feel like our systems are failing and we're going to freak out on our kids. Mm -hmm. Let's just pump the brakes twice, <laughs> say a quick prayer to God and regroup. Like what a great little translation into that too yeah thanks Kristen sorry guys mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. well friends I, I wanted to spend a, just a few moments talking about the lessons for this uh this month um so I I have in my hand I have the activity book uh if you have it want to follow along great if you don't I'll go through it just the same and uh, I just want to go through what it has set aside for October. Um, and it starts on page seven. And if you know, look and follow along at home. Um, and the activities, as you guys have hopefully picked up from the last set. And by the way, if you're, if you're keeping up with them and you're doing great, that's awesome. If you're falling behind, it's okay. Forgive yourself. It, just do the best you can. Uh, we're, we're, we're in crazy times anything we can give our kids is going to be great. Um, um, pump the brakes and start again. Pump the brakes and start again. Right on. <laughs> um, there's a prayer here. It says it's the act of faith. Um, it's a good prayer to pray. And it's got this, this thing where it says in the space below, you practice writing this prayer, or you can draw a picture of what the prayer makes you think or how it makes you feel. As I said earlier on, some of these, these uh, activities are going to be fine for first graders. It might not be fine for your eighth grader. 
Some are going to be great with your sixth grader and forget it for your second grader. It's just not going to work that way. It's just, just do the best you can with each uh, activity, you know, with what's in front of you. Um, there is a scripture memorization. Uh, it's, it's from Hebrews, faith is the realization of what's hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. Um, so there's that. There's a brief essay on what is faith. Uh, it's something to go through. And I, I think just trying to do what we did, uh, them reading this by themselves might not get a whole lot out of it. Us talking about it on their level, based on our understanding of it, I think will go a lot farther. Um, there is, a, a, again, not necessarily a first grade activity, but a faith and uh, belief scripture search where you can look, have them look in the Bible and uh, have them write out the verse and spend some time reflecting on each one before talking about them with your family. Uh, here is the Apostles' Creed, and it says, look for the 12 articles of the Apostles' Creed. <laughs> the Apostles' Creed, there's two versions of the creed we say in the church. One's the Nicene Creed. That's what we normally say on Sundays at church. It's a little longer. We'll tend to say the Apostles' Creed during Advent and Lent. Uh, there's another essay called How Do We Know God? And it's just, just the stuff that we talked about at the beginning. Uh, who is God? In the space below, write or draw your answer to the question, how would you describe God? Yeah, that can work for a first grader as well as an older kid. Uh, attributes of God. We talked about the attributes of God, but here it's just using scripture. Uh, it gives the scripture verse, and it just, you know, God is holy, um, uh, almighty, all-knowing, unchanging, and omnipresent. Um, but it's just to try to get their, help their heads to get around those big ideas. God is bigger than our worries. In the space below, draw a picture, compose a song, or write a prayer that shows God taking care of you or anything you are worried about. Uh, this might be a good younger kid activity, exploring the Trinity and uses the shamrock, you know, in the tradition of St. Patrick uh, to distinguish the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, and then another thing, exploring the Trinity. Uh, the next set of activities and again, you have to use your judgment. Will this work for my seventh grader? Will this work for my first grader? Just do the best you can. Um, but they're, they're around the days of creation. It just tries to help them use their imagination around the, the days of creation, which I kind of went over fast. Um, and some of them are coloring activities. Some are just, you know, what do you, with light and darkness, what, what are things that you can do when it's dark, the things that you can do when it's light? Um, it just it continues on and builds towards <coughs> um, uh, there's a creation nature nature walk which is something you can do just kind of like what Jen was talking about you know doing the A through Z of God's creation and the things God has made there's one right here on what the things that are appropriate to do you know the, one of the things that um, I didn't cover so much when I was talking was you know it says that on the seventh day uh, God uh, rested um uh and, and the reason god rests on the seventh day is it's how the day that we celebrate the sabbath uh or the jewish people celebrate the sabbath uh it's, it's it's this idea that there's a day that we have to relax that god is teaching us by resting not that he needs to rest but we need to rest and it's a day where we can kind of regroup and focus on him and there's just an activity that goes through the things appropriate to do on god's holy day and things that are not appropriate to do on god's holy day one is creating a Thanksgiving prayer. And then it goes into a thing about St. Francis, St. Francis of our Sunday of the month. We had a blessing of the animals last Sunday. Um, he's a great saint to know. Um, and there is with that um, both a coloring page of St. Francis, but also this is right here, the uh, excerpt from the Canticle of Brother Moon, which is a great prayer to pray to help us reflect on creation and all that God has made. And there's some questions about that, especially for your older kids. Um, there's a search word and then at the end of it there's words to know and we used a lot of big words um, in this but these are good words to review uh, both before and after the lesson uh, because there are you want them to understand these big concepts uh, and that's everything um, I know I hope it doesn't seem like a lot I mean the thing that I, 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 I wanted to stress with you guys is this is hundred percent at your pace uh, do what you can. Do the best you can. Um, I hope. Does this does does this seem doable? Is what I want to ask you guys. Does this seem doable? All right. Is this freaking anybody out?
Okay, I'm, that makes me really happy. I'm grateful for that. Do you guys have any questions? No? Well, thank you guys for sticking with us. We appreciate you. Um, come back next month. I, I, I would, if you, if you feel comfortable coming in person, come in person. Um, if, uh, you know, if this works better for you, great. Um, you know, let everyone else know. I, I, I'm, I, the thing I, I want to say, and I'm just speaking more, more to anyone watching the video, uh, I, I'd love for you guys to participate live if you can, um, because it's just, it helps the, you know, the whole experience. Uh, let's close up in a prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Thank you, guys. Good Father, hey, Son. Tom, Tom yeah. one sec. James, did you have a question? I saw you unmuted. No, no. Okay, good. Just making sure. <laughs> We're right. good. Thank you. Thank you. No All problem. Right. All right, my friends. Hang, hang in there. See you soon. Have a great Thank day, you. everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. I said, don't speak it. Really?